My name is Chris Knowlton. I work with Wowza Media Systems, and I'm here to talk today about uh, adaptive live streaming and how you get from a single stream coming in to many devices going out. And we'll look at a number of different options. Uh, I clearly have a bias with Wowza, I, I suspect, and that maybe that's clear. Just I'll be very candid about it if it's not clear. Um, but I'll also talk about some other possible solutions that you can use for parts of the workflow just so it, you, you understand that there are other options out there. So the, the, the major question that this session hopes to answer is, if you have so many different formats and streaming protocols and devices out there and you want to hit all of those or as many of those as possible in order to address the widest number of users, how best can you do that with the least amount of infrastructure and the least amount of expense? And so we'll take a look at that. Um, First, I'll ask you a few questions, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you the, the high-level overview of what we'll cover in this session. So first of all, how many here are experienced in streaming? And how many are fairly new to this space? OK, excellent. Um, which devices, by show of hands, which devices are you trying to target? iOS devices? Almost everybody. Android, uh, with HTTP live streaming especially? OK, about half. Uh, BlackBerry or 3GPP or Android without adaptive streaming? OK, about five. Uh, Windows Phone? About twice as many as 3GPP. And set-top boxes? A few hands for that as well. OK, very good. So mostly HLS. Oh, just I didn't, I didn't actually specifically ask in here, but let me ask because it, maybe this <coughs> will help answer some of the questions as well. How many are targeting Flash? And how many Silverline? Is there anything else that I haven't covered that you think I should be thinking about? Dash. Dash. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That, that's another good point. Um, so Dash, I, I can touch on that. <laughs> Dash is up and coming. OK. Having done that, let's move forward a little bit. So um, I'll give it just a little bit of an overview of what the challenge is and some of the ways that you can consider solving it and some of the products that you might use to do that. Um, and then Charlie, Charlie Good is the CTO of Wilds, and he'll actually go through a demo, uh, uh, an end-to-end -end demo of here's a stream, here's an encoder, here's how we format or configure Wilds a media server to actually deliver to all these devices. Um, and show you an example of some of those devices, some with network DVR, and show you how you would configure a DRM if we, if we had a DRM license server set up as well. So you'll get a pretty good sense for how you can do it using Wowza, and then think about that as background as you consider what your options are going forward for addressing so many different clients. So the basic workflow for anything that you're doing, of course, is just going to be the basic, I have a camera for a live stream, I'm going to encode it. Um, push it into a, a server. In our case, it'll just be a single origin server, a media server, uh, and then push that to various clients. So I'll build on this when we get into the multi-format workflow here in a few minutes. But that's just the, the basic premise. And it, it, could, it could be a file for those of you who aren't doing live or who are recording something now and then playing it back later. Um, and actually, that's what Charlie will be doing. Is he'll, he'll start with a, a pre-recorded file. Uh, rather than looking at him or me with a live camera, we'll just use one and then feed it through the encoder so it comes out as a live stream, uh, a linear stream on that side. So the challenge then, obviously, based on the questions I asked um, and, and the number of items that you're all trying to reach, the number of platforms and client playback, is that you have all of these various desktops and set-tops that you can go after, including WebM and Dash. How many here do not know what Dash is? I'll define it if, if folks don't know what it is. You all do? Great. OK. Um, and so Dash, you'll see coming out. WebM, I think, is sort of a question mark. It looked like it had some, some legs a, about a year or so ago. And then Firefox recently got tired of waiting for Google to get more stuff out there. And I, I think the sense is that now it's a wait and see game to see what happens and whether or not anyone's really going to pick it up in a big way, including Google themselves with YouTube, perhaps, um, and make that more of an interesting area for us all to invest in. Uh, either way, we, we have support for both WebM and Dash. And in fact, on the floor, if you go to the Wowza booth, you'll see a WebM and Dash uh, combined demo. Uh, in case you're interested in seeing it, not much to see. It just looks like other video, but it, it works very well in any MPEG Dash player. 
uh, of which there aren't very many good examples yet. Okay, and obviously on smartphones and tablets, whether you're going to the old BlackBerry, which is 3GPP and not necessarily adaptive and no smart client or anything, or whether you're going to the, you know, the latest Android tablet or maybe even a smooth streaming application running on Windows 8, uh, you have a wide variety of devices that you're trying to target. And increasingly more people are walking around with iPads and tablets and, and the like, smartphones. So bec that is clearly an area where we want to have some ability to address it fairly easily as people use that screen as a secondary screen in their home or as their primary computing device when they go on trips like, like many of you are probably carrying iPads right now, for example. And then finally, in the living room, increasingly there, we see that even large operators like Comcast and other folks are converting more and more to IP-based delivery of their content and second screen delivery. And also, through all of the devices that you can get on the market, whether it be that smart TV you buy that automatically points you right to YouTube and some of the other kind of streaming services like Netflix out there, or a Roku device, or a Wii, or an Xbox 360, or an Apple TV, you need to be able to hit all of those devices as well, perhaps, or at least some of them. And so we want to make sure that whatever format we use will address all of those. So from an audio and video perspective, obviously, to hit all of those things requires that you also potentially, or at least traditionally, have had to support all these different kinds of flavors and formats. And that's not so much the case now. There are much fewer of these that are actually required, especially if you want to do adaptive streaming. It's mostly the, the ISMV for Silverlight and other smooth streaming players. Flash will be F4F, the fragmented uh, Flash MP4 files, and the TS files for Apple HTTP live streaming. But traditionally, it's been a, a real hodgepodge of formats and protocols that you needed to understand. From a codec perspective, it's gotten a lot simpler because now almost all of these devices will play back H.264 and AAC. So you can sort of commonize around that. And assuming WebM doesn't sort of resurge and, and bifurcate the market as uh, you know, Real and Microsoft used to do with Windows Media um, at one time, then we'll probably be in a kind of nice place where we have a common set of codecs that we can finally use and then work with things like Dash to try and commonize the, the streaming format that we use as well. So we don't have to have HTTP dynamic streaming and smooth streaming and HTTP live streaming. We can just say it's MPEG Dash. Okay. From a media server perspective, I thought it might be interesting just to put up a chart that shows the different types of formats that are supported by different media servers. And so this is not meant to be a definitive list, and it may not even be, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing that my, uh, I'm pretty accurate on most of these. Essentially, and it's not meant for you to have to read here because it, it might be a bit of an eye chart for the folks at the back, but it will be available in the slides. But the idea is basically I picked the, the sort of the top six media servers, both the, both the sort of traditional streaming servers on top, like QuickTime and Real uh, Networks Helix and Windows Media Services, and then more of the more recent ones that focus more on adaptive streaming like IS Media Services, Flash Media Server, and Wileza Media Server, and just compared some of the kinds of streaming formats that they all support. And so you'll see that different ones support different, one, different formats and the like. And so based on what your needs are, some of these may work for you, some of these may work better than others. Uh, you may still find that for whatever you're trying to do, if you want to combine Windows Media with almost any kind of adaptive streaming that is not a Windows Media stream, you'll probably have to end up running two servers. So it's, it's quite possible that one server alone will not meet all your needs, but chances are pretty good that if you want to focus on H.264 and AAC as your common codecs, that two or three of the servers up here can probably meet your specific requirements. In terms of encoders, there are certainly a whole wide range of encoding vendors who are here at Stream Media East that you can talk with uh, there are several encoders that we find that a lot of our customers use, um, whether for simplicity or for price. Um, so, for instance, Flash Media Encoder, Flash Media Live Encoder is, is very interesting to a lot of folks. It limits your options, so it's, it's harder to shoot yourself in the foot, as it were, which is a good thing. Uh, if you're creating smooth streaming files or on-demand MP4 files, we found Expression Encoder does an extremely good, line, uh, good job of aligning everything. If you want one encoder that does sort of an overall, here's uh, you know, one encoder that does everything well, then we prefer Wirecast. And so we use that quite a bit. Um, but you know, it's really going to depend on 
There are many other encoders out there. There are others that we use and, and have found to be quite good as well. So these are just examples of, of what some of the options are for getting the content that you need in order to uh, power a, a scenario like this where you have multiple clients. And then in terms of IP cameras, there are a lot of folks using IP cameras now where before they used to drop an encoding box and a bunch of webcams or something out in a field like for in a, in a sports arena for a sporting event. And we found that uh, quite a few of our customers now are using these other devices that just deliver automatically. They, they encode the content right out of the uh, right out of the port, as it were, as H.264 content. And you can put that right into a media server and deliver it without having to encode. So if you're doing sort of surveillance type things or even with some of the HD versions now, the quality is getting quite a bit better. So if you just need a fixed camera somewhere, for instance, pointing at a, a basketball court or a tennis court or something, uh, and you don't need to add any additional production value by doing a whole lot of moving of the camera, there is that possibility to use something like that and feed that into the server as well. There are a few other things, too, that might be useful to know in terms of transcoding and transmuxing. Let me define those real quick. Um, transcoding is when you're taking one codec and converting content from one or more codecs like H.264 and AAC into some other codecs, uh, perhaps flash video or something like that. Um, it can also mean when you're taking a, a stream that's been, say, encoded at 10 megabits per second and you want to encode it into several lower bitrate versions for adaptive streaming. That's really, some people would refer to that as transrating. Um, you can also do transizing by switching to different resolutions. But in general, these are all, all these operations are referred to as transcoding uh, and, on a more generic basis. Typically to do that requires a lot of resources. Uh, and and one of, you know, two of the ways I think that are the most, other than th just throwing raw hardware at it, two of the ways that are most popular these days are using CUDA cards, GPUs, or Intel QuickSync, uh, which has been doing a, a great job on a lot of things, including main concept encoding. Transmuxing, on the other hand, is where you're actually just taking the H.264 and AAC content and repackaging it, changing the outer envelope, if you will, so that you can deliver that content as smooth streaming or HTTP dynamic streaming or HTTP live streaming without actually having to re-encode the video itself. You're just taking those video and audio packets and putting them in a different package. So it's repackaging or transmuxing, whichever firm, or term you prefer. And it doesn't require much in the way of hardware resources. You can run it through an encoder. Uh, you can also just run it through a server. And, and both, actually all three of the sort of adaptive streaming servers, uh, FMS, IIS, and Wowza, will do some level of transmuxing, at least to HTTP live streaming. And it usually requires just 5 to 10% overhead in order to power that. So you can do that in real time when people are asking for that kind of content for an iOS device. So just as an example, uh, going back to adaptive streaming servers, I have here Flash Media Server, IS Media Services, and Wowza. Just to give you an idea of what inputs and outputs they take, uh, I've listed those here. I won't spend a lot of time on them. I, I want to make sure we get to Charlie's demo and questions. But just so you see that there are different options depending on where you're trying to go and what formats you want on the output, uh, these are the options that you have from those three servers. And of course, eventually you'll see also on there things like MPEG Dash. So uh, once those are fully made part of the released product, we'll add those to the chart. Other examples of uh, products that do transmuxing are these. I mentioned a few of them already. I just thought I'd mention them here as well. Just to give you some reference points on what other devices or products you can use in order to do transmuxing to get all your content uh, into the format you need if you decide not to use uh, Wowza server, for instance. And cloud services also offer a lot of this as well. So sometimes if you don't want to run your own server, frankly, you can go to some of these folks and say, I just want you to do the transmuxing for me, or I want you to even deliver the content for me. I'll give you my one stream in, and you guys take care of all the rest. And so you can work with folks like this to get that kind of uh, service. Uh, in terms of the live tra uh, transcoding and, and the example that Charlie will show here, um, for live transcoding, again, almost any encoding vendor here uh, at Stream Media East will be able to help with some level of live transcoding with different levels of performance and quality and price points. Um, what you'll see here is uh, taking in um, one format, and, out, and our output will always be H.264 and AAC. Charlie, what, are, what, are the, 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 what format are, are the files going to be in that you'll be plugging into the encoder? Uh, MP4. MP4. Okay. 
and then outputting in the different adaptive streaming formats, so transmuxing. Uh, just on the transcoding side, here are some also, again, just a list of names for you. If you're considering having somebody do transcoding for you in the cloud, here are some places you can go that have cloud offerings for transcoding. And then now let's look more directly at, at the problem space for how you take this and make it work with, with media servers and plugging it in um, through an encoder and getting the right clients on the outside. At a, at a really basic level, if we take that diagram I showed earlier, this now is, is you know, basically I'm adding the ability to say we're fragmenting a, a number of streams coming out of the encoder, handing those off to the origin server, and then from there, as the client requests different fragments at different resolutions or different bit rates, these fragments get delivered down to the client. I mean, that's the very base level diagram. If you apply that concept, then we'll skip that part. Edge caching is very good if you're in an enterprise or want to use a CDN for HTTP adaptive streaming. But if you want to take a single encoder now and go out and try and hit all those different formats that I talked about earlier, you potentially are doing something like this where you have, in fact, a whole bunch of different encoders possibly feeding into a bunch of different servers with different formats. Um, and so sometimes the infrastructure traditionally has been pretty complicated in order to hit all these kinds of different devices. As we move more and more towards HTTP adaptive streaming, some of these choices fall off. And the solutions get a little bit easier. So in more recent, uh, what I, I'm calling more recent multi-format streaming, basically this, the servers that will allow you to do multi-format adaptive streaming, it looks something more like this, where you have uh, more servers able to do uh, several kinds of formats. So like uh, Flash Media Server at the top will deliver adaptive streaming both to Flash clients and to iOS clients. IS will do the same thing, but to smooth streaming clients and iOS clients. Um, you still can use QuickTime to reach those RTSP devices that, that won't go away, perhaps. Maybe that's one way to look at it. 3GPP devices, Blackberries, things like that. Uh, and then finally, for uh, IPTV type services, you may still need a separate server in order to reach those, depending on what format the set-top box uses or the, the TV device at the end. But there's also, uh, the way we're going to show you today is what we think of as a simpler way to do it, is where you take uh, the single feed into the, to a single encoder, in this case we'll use uh, Wirecast, and plug that into a Wowza origin server which has DRM and video on demand and DVR enabled on it. And you could have a Wowza edge server in there in, in the, as well for, if you wanted to scale out across a, a wide organization or a wide network. Uh, that's not a requirement, it's optional. But what you'll get out of either the origin or the edge directly will be all of these different formats all at one time. And so, and, and when you're using network DVR, in fact, we actually normalize the content that's coming out of the server in such a way that we store one copy of the audio and video and then repackage it on the fly to deliver to each of these devices. So rather than us storing five different versions packaged differently, we store at one time. So that your storage requirements off of the origin server are much less than if you were actually storing five different flavors of the same content just wrapped up slightly differently. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie, and he's going to actually walk us through how some of that will work and how he can hit different clients and uh, give you an idea of, of what it's like to set that up on a Wowza server and then answer any questions you have. So Wowza, one of the... Wowza is the coolest media server ever. We're going to plug our stuff and show our stuff, so be ready for that. Um, we, we have no user interface. Hopefully it'll be coming soon, something that we know is important. But at this point, we are all controlled through folders and files and XML files and that type of thing. So we're actually going to walk through that process, which, again, is kind of a geeky, uninteresting demo from a, you know, isn't this sexy and cool standpoint, but guess what? It works. So that's the, that's the best part. So what does it take to take a stream from a live encoder, send it into Wowza, generate multiple adaptive bitrate streams, and then deliver it out to all the different, you know, kind of available player technologies? We're going to kind of walk through those steps one by one and show you the streams and all the different formats and talk a little bit about the URL formats. Then we're going to do one more layer on top of that, which is the network DVR. We'll do a quick configuration of that. 
We'll talk a little bit about DRM. I'm not going to show that configuration because at that point your eyes will be spinning in your heads going, why is this guy showing me text files? <laughs> so let's start with uh, application setup. Everything in WOWS is configured through what we call an application, and it really defines what modules you're running, what extensions to the server you're running, what the security context is, what type of streaming you're doing, live or video on demand, what type of protocols you want to be supported, both on ingestion and on playback. That's all configured through something called an application. An application for us is really nothing more than a folder. So I go into the applications folder. Wow, this is going to be hard. I create a new folder. Maybe I'm going to get closer. Um, I can't go around the other side. <laughs> Where's new folder? Oh, awesome. You guys rock. Okay. So we're going to call that live. We're going to create an application called live. And now we're going to do the same thing in the config folder. We're going to create another folder. No, I can't do that thing here. I'm going to create a new folder. And I'm going to call it live as well. And then I am going to copy in. an application.xml file from this folder into that live folder, and we're going to configure that application.xml file for my live streaming. So let's go ahead and edit that file. So everything in WOWS, again, text files, XML. But it is pretty simple, though, once you kind of get into it. Most of it's set up in a default configuration that you can use kind of out of the box. In this case, the default setup is using um, what we call a default stream type, is, which is video on demand delivery. We're going to do live, so we're just going to change that name to live, which tells us we're doing live stream. Oh, yeah. Now it's like cheating. Okay, cool. The next thing we're going to do is define which of the HTTP protocols that we want to use on playback. And we do that through these, what we call live stream packetizers. And that's really what's fragmenting that incoming live stream into the fragments, chunks, packets, however you call it. Um, into those pieces. So for this demo, we're going to show what we call Cupertino, because at the time we developed it, it didn't have a name, uh, which really is Apple HLS. The next one we're going to add is what we call smooth streaming, which is smooth streaming. And then the third one we'll add is what we call San Jose, because again, at the time we developed it, it didn't have a name, which is Flash HDS. So that's now turned on those three protocols. We've defined it as a live stream type. And the third thing we're going to do is we're going to turn on the transcoder. And that really is simple. It's simple as adding kind of the word transcoder to the live stream transcoder element. And now we've said that any streams that hit this application are going to run through the transcoding process. And the transcoding process, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward as far as matching a, the, an incoming stream to a transcoding template. In this case, it uses a hierarchical list or a, a linear list of templates. Um, there's two defined by default. One is a template that matches the stream name with the name.xml. So say you wanted to do a specific uh, transcoding on a per stream basis, you can actually just create a stream name.xml file that describes how you want that stream to be transcoded, put it in the transcoder templates directly, directory, and that stream will be transcoded you know, using those specific settings. Or if there isn't a match for there, it'll default to what we call our default transrate.xml file, which is the one that we're going to play with today. And you know, that has some kind of nice default settings to give you a nice array of adaptive bitrate streams uh, for delivery really to both mobile and desktops, as well as set-top box. So for this, we're going to leave it alone. And then we're going to show you what the transrate.xml looks like. And really, that's it. You've now defined an application doing live streaming, supporting all the different HTTP protocols, and it's going to use the transcoder, and it's going to use the transrate template. So we're going to save that. And we are going to go down to the transcoder templates. And I'm going to edit the transrate.xml template just to see, show you what that kind of looks like. Can you guys read all this, is it, or is it impossible? OK, cool. So the idea behind the transcoder is stream coming in. And now I can define encoding blocks that describe how I want that incoming stream to be transcoded. 
that those new streams will have a new name within the server, individual stream names, and they really truly will be individual streams within, within that application that then we can then, you'll see how we group them together into multi-bit rate adaptive streams. So in, ca in this case, you can see the top in code block is called what we call a pass-through block. So since the stream coming in from our encoder is gonna be H264 AAC, we can use that stream as our high bit rate stream. So it'll be inc included in the transcoding process, but it'll be simply passed through. So in that case, the codec we're using for that stream is passed through and for the video as well as the audio. The next encoding block uh, is generating a 720p rendition. We'll walk through this. It's currently turned off because we we're not gonna use that rendition. But um, you can see how you define a kind of true transcode. You give it a name, and the name is kind of arbitrary. In this case, we're gonna call it our 720p transcode. You also define how you're going to map the stream name that's incoming to the, out, to the transcoded stream name. In this case, my incoming stream name from the encoder is gonna be my stream. And so what we're gonna do is append the underscore 720p to the stream name for this new transcoded stream. We're then gonna define which transcoder we're, oh, then we're gonna define the codec. In this case, we wanna transcode the H.264. And then we can define which of the uh, acceleration technology, uh, technologies we wanna use, or if we wanna use the software encoder. In this case, so there's three choices. Default, which uses the software encoder. CUDA, which uses CUDA uh, um, GPU resources if they're available on the machine. And then QuickSync will use the Intel QuickSync um, acceleration. So there's really three choices. Today we only offer the CUDA and QuickSync on Windows. We hope in the future to offer at least the CUDA transcoding on Linux, and that's something that's you know, hopefully to come. Can you use CUDA and QuickSync? Yeah, so the same transcoding template can use CUDA and QuickSync. A single transcode can only use a single acceleration. Um, and at this time, only the, the encoding process is accelerated. In the future, we plan to actually add support for accelerated decoding. And then you could actually mix. You could decode with CUDA, encode with QuickSync. What's the performance difference between the two? Software, between CUDA and QuickSync? Can you repeat the question for the? Oh yeah, so what is the performance? So the question is, what is the performance differences between CUDA and QuickSync? They're actually like very, very similar. There's, you could, on our website, there's a chart that shows uh, some of the performance characteristics of the transcoder. And you'll see QuickSync and CUDA are very similar when you look at uh, the kind of high end of CUDA compared to the like 2600K Intel processors, very similar. So does this all kind of make sense? It's, though it's all text files, it's actually not very co complicated. We give you a pretty good like starting template and you can kind of use that and spin off of that. Uh, further down, we're defining the frame size so you can do scaling, you can do letterboxing, all sorts of options around how you, what you want to do with the frame size. Uh, below that, you can pick the profile so for H.264, I can pick either baseline or main. And again, I'm gonna use main to target the higher end devices like desktops and iPads. I'm gonna use baseline to target mobile devices because it's a much simpler decode for the mobile device. I can select my bit rate. Um, one of the cool things that we do is you can just uh, decide how you want the keyframing to work. In We're using, for this example, the mode of follow the source. And what that does is it, every time the source video stream has a keyframe, the, the transcoded stream will also generate a keyframe. And what this does is make sure that those, those streams are in perfect alignment. Um, so if you're gonna use your source stream in the group of multi bitrate adaptive streams, then you wanna use the follow source setting so that you make sure the transcoded streams, you have the keyframes at the exact same location. Uh, next is a section which allows you to do overlays at this time, uh, we can do kind of static overlays. You can have multiple overlays. You know, these are things like logos, uh, you know, scoreboards, that type of thing. You can overlay on top of the image as part of the transcoding process. And then the last section is really around uh, the audio. And again, since the audio coming in is AAC and it's already in a you know, decent bit rate, we're just gonna pass it through. If, if we wanted to transcode it, we could change the codec to AAC, give it a bit rate, and we would retranscode that audio to you know, potentially a lower bit rate um, for say a mobile device. So that's basically how you set up a transcoding template. Most people use ours out of the box the way they are. They might turn on or off some of the profiles in each one of these uh, examples. 
but they really are a good starting point. So we support, so what, what's the main difference between the transcode and the trans rate uh, templates? That's the question. So there's really two scenarios that we're trying to support. One is my incoming stream is H.264 and AAC, and I want to do adaptive bit rate using that incoming stream as the high bit rate. The other scenario, with, with, and that's the trans rate case. The transcode case says my source is MPEG-2 with MP3 audio or my source is MPEG-4 part 2 and I want to transcode that to multi-bit rate but I can't use my source stream because it's not H.264 AAC. In that case you would use the transcode template and it just tweaks the settings a little bit. We're no longer going to use the source as one of the bit rates and we're going to always transcode the audio. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. You could, as long as all the devices you want to target uh, support MP3. One example is Android. Like, I, I believe if you send a video and audio stream to Android, it can't play MP3. Right? It has to be AAC. So in that case, you'd want to transcode. Yep. Cool. So th that's it. So we're now set up to do adaptive bit rate with an encoder that's sending us like a single bit rate stream. So I'll go ahead here and fire up. If I can find it. So I have a Wirecast encoder sitting here running. That seems to be frozen. <coughs> Why is that not moving? Let me try again here. How much time do I have? Am I good? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go through the encoding side. So we're going to use Wirecast for this example. And if I go ahead and go into my broadcast settings, <coughs> I'm going to send a live stream from the Wirecast encoder you know, off to my WOWSA server. The, the configuration is actually quite simple. I mean, the, really, the, the kind of three things you have to worry about are um, which encoder preset you're going to use. In this case, we're just using the default uh, flash high bandwidth 16 by 9 encoder preset. Um, the second thing is the address. So how am I going to address the WOWSA server? Again, since the WOWSA server and the encoder are running on the same box, I can address it with localhost. But um, in most cases, this is going to be the localhost bit. It's going to be the IP address of your WOWSA server. Um, we're going to send it to port 1935 because that's the default port for our TMP. And we're sending it to that live application that we just configured. So that's, that basically needs to be the name of the application that you, just, that you configured in Wowza. And then the, second piece, the third piece is really just the stream name. In this case, we'll just use my, my stream as the stream name. And the stream name is case sensitive. Some people get burned by this. It is important that you kind of use the same, case, the same case in both places. So we're going to go ahead and save that configuration, and we'll fire up the Wowza server. And if the demo gods are with me, we'll start sending the stream to the Wowza server. And we should see. Yep, so hard to read all this gobbledygook, but this just shows us that the stream is running. We do show as the first 10 packets are gener generated by the packetizers for each of the protocols. We actually show some statistics about those packets just so you can see that it's working and it's a good way to debug kind of problems if you have problems with your encoder. Uh, so you can see all that is running. So we now know we have the streams running. And so now let's go ahead and start to play back some of these streams. Oh, let's talk a little bit about URL formats. So with each one of these different streaming protocols, the way they're differentiated from a player standpoint is by the URL that you use to play that stream. So in this case, we're really going to show the URLs for, the, for four different flavors. We can add a fifth one in if we want to, but four different flavors of that stream. So the first one is Flash RTMP, right? So to, to address a stream in, in, with Flash RTMP, it's simply the IP address of the Wowza server. In this case, it's localhost, the application name, and the stream name. 
for, if I want to use Flash HDS, again, it's a very similar URL. It's the, you know, addressing the WOWS server. We have the, the application name, we have the stream name, and then we tag a manifest.f4m on the end of it, and that tells us that we're playing the HDS version, the HTTP version. Similar for Apple HLS, uh, that the post fix for that URL is playlist.m3u8. And for smooth streaming, the post fix is the word manifest. And that is really all that it takes to differentiate between the different streaming protocols. It's really just whether it has a prefix or not, or what those prefixes are. Question? So the, the scenario you, you set up here is you know, like a relatively straightforward. Yes. Um, you've got what, what seems like a thing set up for both and both the streaming and the streaming Right. So, so you caught me. So the question is, what about a more complex setup where you want to group this, the adaptive bitrate streams differently, differently for the different output devices? And the truth is, I, I just skipped that part of my demo. I apologize. So let's go back and circle back on that. Let's go back to the translate template for a minute. And if you go all the way to the bottom of the translate template, there is a, it gives you the opportunity to group streams together and give them a name as a group, as an adaptive bitrate group. So in this case, we've created two groups of streams. One's called the name of the incoming stream name underscore all, which includes all the different bitrate renditions of that stream. And then we, and that's this, so you can see that set up here. And then the second one is a bitrate, a grouping that we're gonna call mobile that covers the two lower bitrate, lower bandwidth um, renditions of that stream. You can create any numbers of these groups that you like, but that's really how you solve that problem. So those gives it, it, produce, it gives logical names to those groups of streams so that you can use those then when you play back the stream. So you're like making sure I'm straight on this stuff. That's good. Does that make sense? Cool. And we actually had an example here. If you go through these URLs, the second set of these URLs are showing what those, uh, how to address the adaptive bitrate streams. And again, really the only difference here is that the stream name, instead of being the simple incoming stream name of my stream, is gonna use this grouping functionality. So you use the prefix n group colon, and then you use the group name. And that will address the stream name group for that adaptive bitrate stream. So in this case, we're doing all. If I wanted to do the mobile one, it'd be my stream underscore mobile. So let's go back and quickly make sure I'm like, it really works. Hopefully it will. So again, within the WOWSA directory, uh, the inst installation directory, we, do we ship with a bunch of different players for video on demand streaming, live streaming, a bunch of different scenarios. So if you go into the examples directory, you'll see a live streaming section. And then we include streaming uh, players for Flash for, and for Silverlight you know, as well. So we're gonna go ahead and use the OSMF base player. So it's already set up by default to address a stream on the local server by the name of my stream. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that, and this is gonna play the stream that's coming direct, the single bitrate stream that's coming directly from the encoder. Now again, if we wanted to address the stream, one of the group streams, one of the adaptive bitrate streams, I would just change this to n group colon, and append an underscore all to the end. Say play. And now you can see I get the lower bitrate rendition to start, and you'll see it'll slowly kind of tick its way up through the bit rates uh, once it sees I have more bit rate to play back the stream. So we got a little bit clearer, and certainly if I go full screen, I'm, I'll probably get up to the higher bit rate stream. I can do the same thing with Silverlight. So we have a Silverlight base player in the examples folder, client Silverlight. I'll go ahead and start that. Again, same thing, we're addressing the local incoming stream. I can play that. Or I can go ahead and change the name here, include the end group prefix and add the all to the end. And that'll now play the multi-bitrate stream. 
And again, you can watch it uh, switch up through the different bit rates. It should get clearer and clearer and clearer as we go. So that's the adaptive bit rate piece. And again, on the iPhone, same thing. Um, I should have brought my iPad, I apologize. But here's that same stream on the iPhone. So with a little bit of text, a little bit of geekiness, you know, I now have done adaptive bitrate streaming from one encoder, uh, multiple bit rates. It's actually pretty simple. Once we put a UI on, it'll be even easier. So next, let's layer one more. Oh, nice error message. So let's, let's layer one more um, element on to the end of this, which is the network DVR. So again, I'm going to go back and edit my, I'm going to shut down the server to start with. I'm going to go in, and it, it's pretty easy to add the network DVR. The idea behind the network DVR is it's going to save that in, those incoming live streams into a DVR cache. The cache is going to be uniform for all the different streaming protocols, so we save the content once, and then we can restream it out for a Flash HDS, Apple, Apple HLS, as well as smooth streaming. Um, so there aren't like kind of multiple storage, multiple versions of the content. Uh, and then it allows you to pause, rewind a live stream. You can control the DVR window. It'll roll the content off as it flows outside of that DVR window. And then you can also create multiple renditions of a stream and go back and play it as VOD later. So if I record you know, a one hour presentation today, people can come in and start at the live point if they join halfway through while the live event is happening. If they want, they can start at the beginning of the live event when they come and join during the event. Uh, but they can also come back three days later and see the live event from the beginning to the end. I mean, that's really kind of the function of the DVR as, as we know it. So to turn on the DVR, it is a packetizer type. So all I have to do is go to the end of my list of available packetizers and grab the DVR streaming packetizer and add it to the list. And then I just need to turn it on. And I go down to the DVR sec section of application.xml, and I turn on the DVR recorder by adding DVR recorder to the recorders. And I turn on the storage, and this just says I want to store it on my local server. There's a path here where you can define exactly where you want to put all the DVR content, and that's basically it. So I save that application.xml file, I fire up the server, and now we're going to have those streams DVR'd. If I go ahead and look, if I look in my DVR directory, you'll see there's a live directory, the application instance name, here's the different streams, and I can see it's you know saving off the DVR content and as each one of the chunks is coming into the server. And I could go through the whole process of playing back the streams, but I'm sure you believe me, they play. So now we have DVR content where we can pause and rewind a live stream. So the third, so is that any questions around that? Yes? So the question was, how does this all work if I'm using a CDN to deliver content? So there's kind of two scenarios, right? One, CDN uses Wowza. Um, and you're going to not use Wowza locally. You know, you're not going to use a media server locally. Your encoder is going to send up to a CDN that's using Wowza, and all this configuration will be set up for you. They'll be doing the transcoding and the delivery piece. So that's kind of one scenario. The second scenario is maybe there's something you want to integrate on the back end with your encoder, and there's some reason for you, or maybe you want to deliver some of your streams directly out of the Wowza server on your local premise, but then you also want to use the CDN for overflow. In that case, you might have a, a local Wowza running. You'll do all the same configuration locally. And then we have a push publishing module, which allows you to push streams to the CDN. So you could do all the transcoding locally, all of the, maybe you're inserting metadata, all the packaging you need to do locally. And then you would push those streams up to you know, either a Wowza-based CDN or even a non-Wowza-based CDN using our push publishing module. Yes? Uh, there's a, a streaming partners link on our website. I mean, some examples are Mirror Image, Fit Gravity, Influxus, Stream Guys, uh, Stream High Winds. Are all yeah, have some bits of Wowza technology. 
Yeah, go to wowza.com slash partner. There's others, yeah, yes. There are about 20, I think. Yep. We're in about, what, 45% of the CDNs run some bit of our software. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other questions? I like this. This is geeky. This is my kind of demo. So the third thing is DRM, and I'm not going to go through that configuration. DRM for us is an add-on module, so a very similar process of adding a DRM kind of configuration into application.xml. I'm not going to bore you with that. But let's go over the concept of DRM and how it works inside the Wowza server. So the idea is you can, you can kind of feed us live unencrypted content or unencrypted VOD content, make that available to the Wowza server. And what we can do is we'll do the encryption as the content's being delivered to the user. So we can apply both play-ready encryption as well as Apple uh, AES-128 encryption you know, on the content as it's being streamed out to the, you know, the end user. We have integrations with you know, three different key server technologies, uh, EasyDRM, BiDRM, and Verimatrix. We will add more you know, kind of as we move forward. Um, but the whole setup process is, is very simple. I mean, you kind of get an account with one of those DRM key service providers, add a little bit of extra XML code in your application.xml file that defines you know, that you want to turn on this new service. And then you're going to map stream names to key IDs is basically the process in a text file uh, for mapping how you want each of the streams to be encrypted. I think it's more important to understand the concept behind what we're, how we participate in the DRM process. We're really encrypting the unencrypted content as it's leaving the server. We're not a key server. We work with third-party vendors that, who are key servers. Any questions? For the truly paranoid, is there a way to send uh, encrypted content to the browser server uh, as some sort of shared key information? Not yet. You, you could build something like that today with our API. That's possible. Uh, but we do not have uh, that built in as a service yet. It is something we're, asked, we're looking at because we do get that question a lot. People do not want their content on disk unencrypted, and so it is something we're looking at. Any other questions? Sure. So the question was, uh, can you talk a little bit about Origin Edge? How do you scale live streaming? Sorry. Oh, you're going to go back to I was just going to bring yeah, up the, the picture because uh, he mentioned the picture. Uh, if I can get it to do so. One moment. Oh, hang on. Do, 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 do. Right, so the, the idea is with a, is, you know, obviously live streaming um, with a single Wowza box will, with a single media server will get you to a certain size audience. Oh, that's a great multi slide. Uh, to a certain size audience. But once you scale, once you're beyond the size of a single server for delivery, you need to go to some type of, you know, s scaling <laughs> structure. Uh, in this case, for us, it's Origin Edge for live streaming. And the idea is you send your live stream to a single origin. And then I can have multiple edge boxes, right, that are going to do the actual delivery of that live stream. Um, you know, and the way it works is as soon as the first user comes in to request a live stream from a particular edge box, it'll make a single connection to the origin box for that live stream and deliver that live stream between the origin and the edge, and that edge will be responsible for delivering that stream out to the user. Then if more users join, they're all going to see that same single stream that's coming from the origin but they're, you know, it's going to be played out through that edge. That's the basic concept. On the origin server. Yes. Yeah, so all the DRM, all the DVR and, and uh, DRM operations are occurring on the origin. 
and that content will be then be forwarded to the edge, protected. Yeah. And and just to go a little bit further, so application for for the configuration for uh, origin and edge can be done on a per application basis. So actually, a Wowza origin can also act as an edge, and you can have also multiple chains of origins. So I can go from and a Wowza origin server to a second Wowza origin server to a set of edges. So if you need a more complex topology, say a CDN, you might put an origin in each pop location, right? And then have a single origin where the ingress for a live stream that goes out to the multiple origin servers that goes out to the multiple edge servers. So the topology is very kind of fluid and, and can be done on a per application basis to, to really allow for you know, really properly loading machines. They're taking advantage of hardware. Any other questions? Yes? I imagine you're looking at it like multicast delivery of adaptive bit rate. So the question is, do we do multicast delivery of adaptive bit rate? N not yet. We do multicast of single bit rate, but we do not do, not do multicast of adaptive bit rate. But you're working on it. We are definitely considering that. We are considering it. No promises. <laughs> it's, cool. it's a cool idea. Yeah, we had actually several customers ask for it at the show. Oh, really? So you could do uh, multicast out of the Wowza and adaptive bit rate in the cast out of the Wowza, yes? Correct. Just not combined yet. <laughs> and, we, and we will soon release a, and we're showing it at our, at our booth, we'll soon release a Silverlight-based player uh, that can play a multicast stream directly. So you can feed a multicast stream out of Wowza, and then with nothing more than the Silverlight plugin, which is on you know, many desktops already, and our Silverlight player, you'll be able to play that multicast stream directly. So, I mean, at least where you're in a situation where it's you know, enterprise educational, where you have the opportunity to multicast within your local network and maybe unicast outside, we have a solution for that. Yeah, and to be really clear, it's, it's not Windows Media multicast in this case, but just traditional RTP multicast with H.264 AC content. Yes, it's actually transport stream. Okay. Yep. I see a question over there. Yes, you, so the question is, can you record the transcoded streams? Yes, you can record the transcoded streams as well as the original source stream. Yep. The, we, don't, we cannot guarantee that the recorded streams will be properly bitrate aligned yet, right? So if you record all four bit rates of the stream, they're not necessarily, when you play them back, they will not necessarily work properly for adaptive bitrate delivery. So at this point, we suggest that you record the high bitrate stream and use a file transcoder to generate the, the adaptive bitrate streams. I mean, just, you know, we don't like to put anything out that's really not done yet. So, um, but at some point, we hope to allow you to record adaptive bitrate streams, and then we will guarantee that they're properly bitrate aligned. Yes? So the question is, how many input streams can be handled by a single application? Um, I mean, we have people running up in the hundreds, you know, like uh, about a hundred. It all, a lot of it's server performance, a lot of it's the bit rate of the incoming stream. Um, yeah, it can be a lot. Yes? Moonlight support? <laughs> so that's Silverlight on Linux? Yes. I have I, I, I don't know. We have not played with that at all. Moonlight support was the question. It's one of those things where if it works on Silverlight, hypothetically it works on Moonlight, yeah. but, but we've not tested with Moonlight. And we've, interestingly enough, not had any requests for that. <coughs> Anything else? Good. I do appreciate you kind of getting through the geeky part of our demo. I have a, a follow-up question for all of you now. Having seen the geeky demo, <laughs> how many of you are comfortable uh, with editing XML files and all like Charlie was doing. Very good. And how many of you would really prefer to have a graphical user interface? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so almost half, a third to half would like the UI. That's good for me to know while, while we're planning out the, the product roadmap. Excellent, uh, I think there are survey forms, is that correct? Please fill those out just so we know if it's good, bad, indifferent. It's, it's useful for us as we try and figure out what we're gonna do next time if we're invited back to, to uh, <laughs> show another geeky demo or, or maybe even a not so geeky demo next time, we'll see. Uh, and are there any other questions before we go? No? 
All right. Thank if you have you. questions, feel free to come on up. But thanks for coming. And if you have further questions or you think of something after you leave, either visit us at the booth or feel free to send me mail at chris at wowza.com.